In April 1863 in Columbus, Mississippi, after decorating graves of her two sons who died representing the beloved Southland, <laughs> cancer culture, listen to this. <laughs> They're going to cancel Memorial Day. They're going to find out this, that this is how Memorial Day started. We're going to, this will be the last Memorial Day we ever have. <clears throat> After decorating the, son, the graves of her two sons who died representing the South, an elderly woman walked to two mounds of dirt at the corner of the cemetery to place memorial flowers there also. What are you doing, her friend said. She shouted back. Those are the graves of two Union soldiers. Softly, the compassionate mother said, I know. I also know that somewhere up north, a mother or a young wife is mourning the loss of the people that will never come home. Folks, that's America. The loving deed, because of that, what happened in Columbus, Mississippi in 1863, the loving deed set in motion our celebration what has been known now as Memorial Day. We honor the war, Dad, once a year, but their sacrifice is evident every day of the year because of all the freedoms that we have. Today, we want to honor the memory of all those who have sacrificed their lives on the altar of freedom. Those thousands of sacrificed lives were not given in vain. And us here at the Cowboy Church, for sure, thank you so very much. Because of their sacrifice, we are absolutely free today and have the right to assemble ourselves together Worship our God. Think of the numbers of those who died to preserve the freedoms we endure, endure today. I'm going to give you some statistics now, and we're going to flat go get it this morning. Revolutionary War, we lost 25,324 Americans. Civil War, we lost 620,115 Americans. World War I, we lost 116,710 Americans. Americans. World War II, we lost 407,316 Americans. Korean War, we lost 54,546 Americans. Vietnam War, we lost 58,098 Americans. The first Gulf War, we lost 293 Americans. And the Iraq War, we lost 18, 819 Americans. We've lost millions of American men and women. And that does not include the ones that were blinded the ones that came back paralyzed, the ones that came back with post-traumatic syndrome that ruined their lives forever. This day, this day, we're to remember those people, men and women, for their bravery, for their courage, and for their love of the red, white, and the blue. <clears throat> so today, I don't want to diminish the sacrifice and service of these brave, and they are brave, men and women who served our nation so carefully, carefully, but also so very valiantly. But I want to talk about one great soldier. I want to talk about the greatest soldier to ever live. The great soldier stepped into a harsh battlefield one day. He took up arms and entered the fight knowing that it would cost him everything. The soldier bravely entered the battlefield and won a great victory, but at a terrible price. This great soldier gave his life, not for a nation, but for all humanity. He was not, give, he was, he was not a life given in vain, but the sacrifice of his life served to set free the captives of sin. For the child of God, every day is Memorial Day. We need to remember the sacrifice of heaven's greatest warrior, heaven's greatest soldier today. Let us remember a man named Jesus and the sacrifice he made for us all. <clears throat> Jesus laid aside his heavenly address for us. Like every soldier who's ever served in the armed forces, when Jesus came to earth, he also left his home. He had, for, he, he had been there for all of eternity. eternity. He lived in heaven. He had existed in a place of perfection, free of sin, pain, suffering, and sorrow. He originated in a land he was exalted. Jesus came down here on earth to live as an example, to prove a point. He came down here to save us from sin, but to save us from ourselves. And now it's to the point where we have to save us 
from everybody around us. He originated and he was exalted in heaven. Yet he willingly left that behind to enter this sin-cursed world, hate-filled world. He came to a world where even those he had longed his appearing would reject him. John 1, 11. He came to a land where he would be ridiculed, hated, and killed. Yet he came anyway. God came to the earth and he robbed himself and uh, robed himself in human flesh. John 1, 1, 14. He lived as a man among men and died as a man to redeem man from themselves. We may never forget our Savior is no ordinary man, but he is a God in human flesh. When soldiers enter the army, they cease to wear the same clothes that they wore as a civilian. They don the uniform of their country. When Jesus came into the world, he willingly concealed his heavenly fame within an earthly fame frame. He took upon himself the body of a man. Philippians 2.5.8 here was God, the creator of the universe, born as a baby in Bethlehem. Here was God, to whom belonged the earth and the fullness thereof, with no place to lay his head. Matthew 8, 20. Here was God, who had made everything that was, and who said, If I were hungry, I would not tell thee, for the world is mine and the fullness thereof. Psalms fifty twelve, Absolutely dependent upon a human mother for his necessary food. Because Jesus left heaven and came into this world, he knew pain, suffering, rejection, hunger, thirst, loneliness, fame, not fame, defaming, and many other problems that are part of the human condition. He suffered all of that. He did that so he might fill our pain and sorrow so that he would know how to comfort us in our trials to come. Hebrews 4, 14, 16. <clears throat> Hebrews, if you're looking, Hebrews 2, 18, 1 Peter 5, 7. When Jesus came into the world as a man, he lived in this world as a man. He died on the cross as a man. He rose again from the dead as a man. He ascended into heaven as a man. And when he comes back again, he will be the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And then we'll be able to tell him, thank you for all the sacrifices that you did so that we could overcome this world. Amen? When Paul says he was justified in the Spirit, even of angels, preached to the Gentiles, believed in this world. Jesus was not prejudiced. Jesus preached to all. Jews, Gentiles, black, white, rich, poor, handicapped, healthy. Jesus preached to everybody, and he preached the same gospel. Remember his perfect service. The phrase, justified in the spirit and seen of the angels, speaks of divine approval that was upon his life and work. From the time Jesus was baptized in the Jordan, he began his earthly minister. The power of the Holy Ghost was upon his life. In fact, Jesus did all he did, not as God, but as a spirit-filled man. He perfectly accomplished what Adam had failed to do. The miracles, the power teaching, the changed life, the statements from God. Matthew 3.17 proved that Jesus was operating under divine approval from God himself. God the Father saw the service. He rendered, and he was pleased. Another proof that God's sanction was upon the Lord Jesus is the statement, seen of angels. From the announcement of his birth in Luke 2, to the angels ministering to him in his temptation, Matthew 4, to the angels who spoke to the woman in the empty tomb, Jesus was the recipient of, of angelic love and presence. They watched as the Creator was born. They watched as He lived among men and fulfilled the plan of God. They watched with their heads on the hilts of the sword as He died, just waiting for His orders to come and get Him. But those orders never came. See, Jesus did not want to be taken off that cribe, that cross. That ultimate warrior, that ultimate soldier knew that He had to stay there for all those hours and sacrifice, not be able to bleed, breathe, bleed to death, basically. He had to stay up there and suffocate, or it would have meant nothing. If he didn't die on that cross, he couldn't have been buried in a tomb, that three days later that he would leave, that later after he left that he would be ascended into heaven. These things went into a program that God already had planned, 
and Jesus fulfilled every single one of them. At any time, the Bible teaches us that Jesus had legions of angels that could have come and rescued him. I don't know if you know your Bible or theology well or not. A legion is 3,500. If you could have 10 times 3,500 angels at your beck and call all the time, why would you not call upon them to save you? Why wouldn't you? Because the ultimate soldier had a job to do, and death was part of that job. Because he loved us that much. He loved us not to call upon those 10 legions, the 3,500 times 10, the 12 times 3,500. He loved us so much, he said, no, I'll accept this punishment because I love you. I know that you're going to make mistakes. I know that you're going to still sin, but I'm going to forgive you. I'm going to take this beating. I'm going to take this crown. I'm going to carry this cross. I'm going to bleed. I'm going to get tormented. I'm going to get chastised. I'm going to get drilled, and I'm going to die. But good God Almighty, I'm going to resurrect. And when I do, I'm coming back. <laughs> Note to self, don't scream so loud. When Jesus came to the world, he was born. He lived and died without sin. 2 Corinthians 5.21, 1 Peter 2.21-22. He perfectly fulfilled the law of God, and his service was accepted by the Father. And that's why, that's why I don't have to try to please God to be saved. Jesus had already satisfied all the demands of God. 1 John 2, 2, Romans 3, 25, his work has been accepted by the Father and is imputed to all those who believe in him by faith. Romans 4, 24, remember his perfect sacrifice. The phrase, justified in the Spirit, also speaks about the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. You see, Jesus did not just come to the world to live. Jesus came to the world to die. Just like any soldier that picks up that rifle, that puts on that uniform, that proudly says, United States of America goes into battle. They know <clears throat> there is a high probability in war. You're not coming home. And if you do, it's in a body bag. Jesus knew when he came to this world that he was going to be killed. He was a sacrificial lamb. Jesus did this so we could have an example of how to love one another, help one another, how to forgive, how, how to, to love God how to help those in need. But Jesus' big thing that he, he, he was here, it was his unselfishness and his ability to teach people and teach people how to love one another. If we were in this world today and everybody would just love one another, what a great world that would be, amen? But Jesus died. Jesus Christ, the perfect, sinless Son of God, was taken to a place called Calvary, and he was nailed to a cross. See, Jesus didn't die because he was a bad man. He didn't die because he deserved death. After all, he was reserved for sinners. Romans 6.23. He died because he came into this world to save sinners. <clears throat> 1 Timothy 1.15. If he was going to save sinners, then he would have to die. And he died. Hebrews 9.22. When Jesus died on the cross, he suffered in ways that we can never imagine. Isaiah 52, 14. <clears throat> but all of his suffering was for one reason. All, all of Jesus' suffering was for one reason. He loved you. He loved you. He loved you too. He loved all of you. He loved all of you. He loved everyone in this room and everyone listening out there. Jesus suffered because he loved you. But here's something really cool. He didn't just love you then. He loved you right now.
His death made, whoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, Romans 10, 13. A real possibility. So let us remember today a man named Jesus who took our sins upon himself and died in our place on the cross. And of course, after Jesus died, he was buried in a tomb and sealed up. Three days later, he was again justified in the spirit when God brought him back from the dead. This is further proof that Jesus was who he claimed to be. The resurrection of Jesus from the dead was God's amen to this world. God from heaven looked down upon Jesus' resurrection and said, amen, we did it. His death has value. Now any lost person can bow before him. Call on his name and through faith in his death and resurrection can be saved forever by the grace of God. And always remember his perfect salvation. We are told that this Jesus was preached unto the Gentiles, believed on the world. Again, we're reminded that his life and death were not just for him. He did what he did because he had a plan to save the lost. His salvation is proclaimed. Paul reminds us of the rejection of Jesus by the Jews, John 1, 11, and how the gospel came to the people who did not, did not know God. But what grace that God would allow his glorious gospel to be preached among people who did not know him and did not want to know him. He sent a saving gospel to a people who were helplessly and hopelessly lost in sin. What grace that God would reach out to people like us who are so vile and so wicked. What grace that God would fix it so that we could be saved through simple faith. What grace that we were allowed to hear about a great salvation. What grace that the word of God came to our hearts and glory and the demonstration of power. Rome 10, 17. Thank God for the proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. His salvation is powerful. We are told by the phrase, believe on in the world, that this gospel message is a powerful one. Romans 1, 16. When lost sinners hear it, those ordained to eternal life are saved by his grace. Acts 13, 48. I praise the Lord for this day the gospel was preached, not just in by my ears, but by the lost hearts and the lost souls of the dead hearted. Thank God that the Spirit of God rejuvenated by dead soul that gave me the faith to believe in him. I praise God for his salvation today. That's why we must never give up on the lost. We never know when the Lord will move in power to save one precious soul. Thank God, God, and Jesus are still in the saving business. The last phrase in this verse is received up into glory. Here, Paul is challenging us to remember the ascension of Jesus back into heaven after his resurrection. There is far more to his ascension than him just rising back into heaven. There's a threefold blessing. One is the glory of the ascension. After accomplishing his earthly mission, Jesus ascended back to his heavenly home and was back in the glory he had before. He was born in Bethlehem, Acts 19, 11. When we see him in glory, he will still have a body. His body will still be marked by the nail prints of his hands and feet. The marks of his thorny crown will still be evident. The stripes upon his back will still proclaim his eternal love for you and me. But when we see him on that day, he will not be the lowly Nazarene anymore. He will no longer appear as Isaiah described him in 53.2.3. When we see him then, he will shine with a glorious, brighter light than we have ever seen. He will be the light of the heaven. Revelation 21.23. If you could see him today, you would be awestruck with his glory, blinded by his brilliance and speechless in his presence. We serve a glorious God today, and one day his servants will see him. Revelation 22, 4, the grace of his ascension. When Jesus ascended, the Bible tells us that he sat down on the right hand of God. Hebrews 10, 11, or 10, 12. This tells us that his work of the redeeming sinners was forever finished. He completed that work and ascended back to heaven as our high priest, as our Lord and Savior, as our King of Kings, as our Lord of Lords. There at the right hand of God in heaven, Jesus makes intercession for you and me as we journey through the land towards home. 
the gravity of his ascension. When Jesus ascended back into heaven, he do, did so with the promise that he would return again someday. And I know a lot of people don't believe that. I absolutely believe that. I believe that one day, I hope I'm alive for it, but I will tell you this, we are closer today than the apostles were that were with Jesus, of Jesus coming back. This generation just may see that glorious day because the Bible teaches us in the book of Revelations the things that will happen prior to the beginning of the ascension, of the, the returning Christ. Wars, volcanoes, fires, earthquakes, threat of wars. People will be horrible to each other, which good God almighty. This world is so bad right now that every time that you think you hear a horn or that you see something funny in the sky, you might want to be in fear because it just might be. We're that close, I believe, to, to God just going, I gave you every chance that you could have. And no matter what I did, it was wrong. I couldn't get you guys to get along. I couldn't get you to take care of my planet. This is horrible. And as generations, we should look at our children and go, how can we make this better? How can we make this better? And I'm going to go political on you for just a minute. If we want to make it better, be a voice. We are the ones that vote. We are the ones that decide. We are the ones that accept things. And we are the ones that don't have to accept things. We are the ones. This little church... These pastors, this congregation, we get people to the cross. Not just inside this church, but out there. Out there on, on AIM and iTube. And somebody asked me, how many, how many do you get to? How many people actually come to the cross because of hearing all of us up here on Sundays? Does it matter if it was only one? Because that's one more than was. Does it matter if it was a hundred and one? No. Does it matter if it was a million to one? No. Because in God's eyes, that one matters. So this church matters. These people that we reach matter. The people that we're getting to the cross, getting splinters in their hands, that matters. Because God matters. Amen? So I'm going to... Can you... I want to have Austin go, doo, doo, doo. I will say a little prayer. I will say this again. You guys know I'm, I'm heavily involved in social media. Um, my, last, I did a, my last four TikToks are 1.6 million, 1.4 million, 1.3 million. The one I did two days ago is 880,000. Um, watch for my TikTok on Monday. If you liked how this started today, I have something to say. Probably gonna get me kicked off, but I'm gonna say anyway. Tell me when you're ready. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Lord, we come to you today in a house that bears your name. We come humbly to you, Lord, and we thank you. We thank you for bringing Jesus to this earth. We thank you for bringing the greatest soldier of all, Lord. I pray that we can all hold hands, Lord. I pray that we can change this nation and bring it back to God. These let, let's make it so that these men and women who lost their lives serving this country does mean something, Lord. This country, the United States of America, was stamped from day one, and God we trust. I think it's time to bring it back to God. I pray, Lord, that you give this nation the strength. I pray that you give this church the strength, this congregation the strength. Everyone out there in any church today, Lord, I pray that you give them the strength to get on their knees and to accept Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior. I pray that you give them the strength to be a voice to change this planet, Lord, to bring it back to you, to bring Jesus into the homes of everyone. Let's just not keep it in the home. Let's bring it back to the school. Let's put it in all the churches. Let's change lives, Lord. Let's help this church bring people to that almighty cross, Lord. In your precious son's name, Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. And if God was listening right now, he would say...